Hi, I'm Kat Rosenfield. And I'm Phoebe Maltzbovey. And we are Feminine Chaos with a special guest today. We have Megan Dom, author of the amazing new book, The Problem with Everything, which we both have. Mine's dirty. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and super excited to have you here, Megan. Can you um, start by introducing yourself and just uh, talk a little bit about your book? Sure. So I'm Megan Dom. I uh, am an author. I'm a journalist. Uh, I'm known primarily as an essayist, although the problem with everything is not an essay collection. Uh, this is my sixth book. I am currently a columnist for Medium, uh, their Gen Mag uh, magazine, and I was a columnist at the Los Angeles Times for more than a decade. And the problem with everything is a book about the current iteration of the culture wars. It's my attempt to make sense of, of the moment and look at some of the generational divides within Me Too, within the free speech issues, um, conversations around comedy, what's going on on campuses, that sort of thing. Uh, and it's it's really more of a self-interrogation than anything else. Um, I think that there, you know, there was a version I could have done with of this that was a polemic, but um, I just think for my own purposes, it was better to kind of look at this through a through a personal lens and also um, have it be as as undidactic as is possible. That's not to say that it isn't in places, but anyway. So that's the problem with everything. Um. I really liked it, um, and I also just noticed, so just in what I'm writing myself now, that I keep writing sentences, and I, I was admittedly already doing this, to start with, like, the problem with, yeah. <laughs> and it just, it struck me that that sort of, like, is part of, but not all of, why you're such a, the perfect feminine chaos guest, <laughs> because, like, I feel it's not just the Aziz Ansari discussion, you know, it's not just the thematic um like I kept reading, I was saying like, I know that story, Kat and I have talked about that story. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We meant to talk about that one or something. And yeah, but just this, I think it's, it's not, I guess, a very now way of looking at things though, right? To, to sort of, to not just kind of, this is good, this is bad, but to sort yeah. of the, the problem with it. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking how fun it is that you've titled this book in such a way that it makes it sound like we're talking very authoritatively. It's like the problem with everything is. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. And actually the problem with everything obviously it functions on a number of levels. One of them being that so many things are deemed problematic these days, but ultimately the conceit for me was to look at, was to name uh the problem with everything is like the conversation that we're having with ourselves all the time. Like it's mm -hmm. that sort of line of inquiry that we're chewing on as we sit in our apartment, as we walk down the street, maybe the conversation that we have with a particular friend or a partner over years, like, like what is the problem with everything? What is wrong with the world? What is it that is making me less happy than I should be or less satisfied? And so the problem with everything is really a, a reference to to a line of conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, the, the title is functioning on many levels, but ultimately to me, it was just about sort of thinking and talking in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think it's great that also that you're on blogging heads and I guess not for the first time, but it's just so perfect for the book because like there's a lot about blogging heads yes. in it. <laughs> we so feature primarily very not meta. us, but, but oh. the, the, net, the network, is it a network? <laughs> <laughs> The thing we're on. It's a, it's a state of mind. That platform, yes. Yeah. Yeah, the state of mind of being a blogging head. Yes, I just, I guess I never, even though I would watch these before doing one, it's just like the, it's just so interesting to read about the experience of um, being on the other end of it. And also just, I think there's just something kind of like discreetly unexpected about this being a woman who's, you know, watching political um, things and not just like, cause I guess the, the sort of the, there's a very, like there would have been a cliched path of like, you know, a sort of woman in crisis moment turns to, and it should be like, you know, like yoga cream or whatever, you know, but something, yeah. something that's not, you know, 
blogging heads. So that's right. what, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, actually, this is, I, this is not something I've talked about a lot, but it might be fruitful for us. Like, cause I sometimes wonder why there are fewer women in this kind of heterodox intellectual space than there are men. And I wonder if that's something that, that you've thought about, like just the fact that you guys are like the only female duo show on blogging heads. Are you not? We are. are. And there's something, you know, we've, we've talked about this on the show before, um, about how it seems like this sort of, um, virulent, uh, strain of progressivism that, that sort of shuts down conversation seems to predominate in women's spaces, um, online, you know, communities like, um, like, mom blogging communities or knitting communities, any place where where women gather, it's only a matter of time until, um, you know, a lot of this kind of policing starts happening over who's privileged and who's problematic. And we've had this conversation before about like, you know, is this happening to men, you know, and if not, why not? Like, why isn't somebody on a fantasy Mm -hmm. football forum being like, Like, look, Kevin, I think you really need to acknowledge your white male privilege right now (laughs) while we, you know, while we make our picks this week. Yeah. That is so interesting. You're right. I never thought of it that way. What I tend to think about are like the uh, this question of whether women are more vulnerable to in-group, out-group dynamics. So the penalties for stepping out of the group think or the clique or the tribe or the club or however you want to uh, define it are maybe greater for, for women, or at least we have the perception that it's going to be harder for us. It's definitely, it's definitely something I think about. Like, why are there not more women in the, in the intellectual dark web, you know? And I, I wonder if it's because they're, we're just more reluctant to separate from our peers in a way. Well, I think there's a lot of this. I mean, this is something I've written about a bit, but just like these sort of privileged disclaimers and essays. Um, and we've also talked about this on feminine chaos, but just this notion that to write about yourself is both this incredibly important um, feminist act, but also if you don't do a checklist of every single person who has it worse, then you are in fact the oppressor and it's terrible um, as comes up kind of, I mean, there's, I don't even know where to begin with examples because there's a lot of pretty good and recent ones. Well, but- your book was, I loved your book. I mean, your book is like the... <laughs> the the final word on this like you or the or the first word anyway I I just thought you you articulated this so so brilliantly and in the pearls of privilege honored to hear you say that but um yeah yeah I just I wonder though about like whether this is just something with like women being socialized to be sort of deferential and agreeable but then but then it becomes this thing where um as we have discussed and Kat and I will probably discuss again and the whole um like that review of Lindy West's we won't go into in detail but a review in the times of Lindy West's book that faults her for not discussing um trans women of color and their plight and I'm sure that Lindy West would be the very first to tell you that there are people who have it worse than she does. But that's almost the reason why I feel like why a review of her book would go there. Mm-hmm. And if she did spend a lot of time talking about trans women of color, the accusation would be that she's speaking for them. Like right. there's really no winning there. Cause if you've got standpoint epistemology running up against privilege checking, that's like a self canceling proposition. It seems. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I think there is something there and also about, you know, not just about women being reluctant to kind of separate from the herd, um, you know, the, 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 the social pressure we experience is maybe different from that of men. Um, but also that there is an expectation that, um, if you're a woman and somebody wants to tell you about yourself, somebody wants to criticize you, that you're expected to listen, you're expected to be receptive, you're expected to feel guilty about it. Um, and that, you know, I, I think you see it a lot in, in a lot of these spaces where somebody comes in and kind of steamrolls the conversation with all of these, um, you know, these new rules about, you know, what you have to disclaim, what you have to tag, what you have to warn people about, that uh, women already feel 
guilty about this stuff. So it's really very easy to get a wedge in there. Um, And, you know, since nobody wants to be the confrontational jerk to be like, no, like you're ruining our space. Stop that. Um, It just happens just, you know, path of least resistance. Yeah. Yeah. People people just leave those spaces. I think like if I see in a space, people putting content warning privilege, which I have seen, I have literally seen this many times and (laughs) it's, I just can't, then I just don't participate, you know, because like what's either I participate by sort of doing the, isn't it called flouncing? Is it when you like leave with a huff and a huff? I think that's when oh. you, yeah, you announce your departure right. and then you depart. Right. That's I mean, I don't know if you can, flounce. I think so. I don't know if you can do that with forums you've only ever lurk, lurked in before. No, but it has to be a vocal. You have department. to have, oh, then I don't think I can flounce, but yeah, I don't know. I think that, but then what happens is you just have to leave the space because it's just too ridiculous. Um, but we have a, a ton of questions, yeah. like so, yeah. so many. Um, and so, there are so, Oh, sorry. Oh no, I was just, I was going to just dive right in. Um, oh, I was just going to say that there's a bit, they're a bit thematic though, because um, in order to narrow things down. Um, so we're super interested in like the generational angle um, mm-hmm. and also yeah. just sort of this quest, this weird feminism of embracing ageism which I think we've talked about a bit on this program as kind of like like to be a woman past I don't know 20 25 whatever the age is is inherently problematic and should be apologized for um so I guess we Kat and I are sort of like at I guess an age-wise like middle ground sort of generationally even though we are millennials we're like at, at we're the old millennials elder yeah, yeah. millennials the, um yeah. yeah i was born in 82 and phoebe you were what 83 80, 83 yeah 83. so um and it's been interesting to see how you know this is a sort of a liminal category and the the feminists in this category the women in this category tend to identify either with more like a gen x kind of a sensibility of feminism or with like a younger millennials version of feminism we don't really have our own right. space there hmm. yeah you guys definitely seem like like spiritual gen xers um, <laughs> what I know of you. So one of the working theories I, I had as I was writing this book was this sort of notion that, that Gen Xers, we grew up fetishizing toughness in a way. Like, you know, it was very much about being separate from your parents, showing that you can be independent, um, especially around girlhood. There was an aesthetic of being a tomboy, of being like, you know, not a girly girl, that was sort of discouraged. That was uncool. Um, We were about being aloof. Uh, And, you know, frankly, there was a lot of bullying that went on in the seventies and the eighties. If you were growing up, I mean, you know, like actual physical bullying, like, like schoolyard uh, getting beat up and stuff like that. And that certainly is, is bad. And, and it's very good that that has been phased out. Although we have a whole nother version of bullying that is arguably worse, but Um, I I was really interested in how my cohort sort of grew up embracing this idea that we were cool, that we were loop, that we were tough. And that was affecting the way we were sort of metabolizing some of the Me Too conversation. And I then began wondering if millennials um, and and Gen Z were having this sort of same version of this around issues of fairness and justice, that they were maybe fetishizing fairness in a way that we were fetishizing toughness. And that was sort of animating some of our, of our divisiveness, like this idea that if you get into a, if you get into a, a, an unpleasant sexual situation, Aziz Ansari sort of scenario, for example, you know, the Gen Xers would say like, well, just run out of there. Like, you know, tell them to fuck off and run out and call a cab, whatever. Uh, And the, the younger women would say, well, that's why should we have to do that? Why should we have to be in this situation to begin with? So, you know, that's kind of like the, the sort of first level way of thinking about this. Um, and my initial instinct when I very first started the book was that like my way was right and their way was wrong. And it was better to be tough than to be obsessed with fairness. But I actually really now think that there were such different conditions of growing up in the seventies and the eighties than there were subsequently that we, we need to be mindful. Like people of my generation need to be mindful of the conditions that I think a lot of millennials 
have to have to deal with, especially when it comes to issues of, of sexual encounters and consent. So, so again, like when I say the book is a self interrogation, it's really a lot of this kind of like thinking through, like the problem is this, but the problem is also that I'm leaving out a lot of stuff and I haven't taken stuff into consideration. Yeah, I mean, I thought that was super interesting just about the, this desire to become an adult versus not having that desire to be an adult. And I just, I think this is also where maybe Kat and I are at a kind of generational like limbo with this, because I just think about kids growing up today who are always, always, always like their parents always know where they are. And yeah. the difference that is from my own youth where they just didn't. There were just times of the day when I could be anywhere in theory. I mean, I wouldn't have been anywhere that, you know, exciting, but well, lower Manhattan, not so bad, but you know, but like, yeah, it just, I don't know. It just seems like that would just change like kind of everything in terms of what seems both that and just like the economic factors of like how sort of financially independent you could plausibly expect to be at what age. So it just seems like it just might like adulthood as understood even like not that that long ago might just seem like impossible for like different sort of structural reasons. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that idea though of autonomy and you talk about sort of toughness and independence in the same, in the same space, in the same sentence, but it's really, you know, that was sort of what I wanted to put a pin in was that idea that like, I don't know, when I was growing up, I really was, you know, I did not want to be seen as a kid for any longer than necessary, you know, totally. wanted, to, wanted mm -hmm. to be autonomous, wanted to be a grown up. Um, and becoming a grown up was like a, a cool prospect. And then actually having it happen was enjoyable, you know, get to set your own bedtime among other things. Mm -hmm. And, um, now what we, what we're seeing so much is not just a change in the way this works for people who are literally coming of age as we speak, but also in the way that even women our age are now starting to kind of rethink their own young adulthoods, um, to be like, well, you know, I thought at the time I was 26, um, you know, I thought I was a woman, but I now realize that I was a child. And, you know, the, oh, the 26 year old child, the 26 year old child. Amazing. Amazing. And it's so like my, my only response to that is really to ask the question, what are they getting out of that? Like, what do you make of that? I mean, I can see why it is appealing if you feel like you have made decisions in that period of your life that you're not comfortable with, that you don't really want to unpack for yourself that you feel uncomfortable analyzing. So you're excusing it with yeah. your, yeah. Say, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't responsible um, because I wasn't a full, you know, I wasn't really a person yet. I just um, wonder how much has to just do with the sort of, again, like the lack of nuance where it's possible that a situation involving a 26 year old woman and a much older and more powerful man would have something yuck about it, but not be like, the evil thing that it would be made out to be today. Yeah, that makes sense. It doesn't like, have to be a foundational trauma. Right, right. So something like where it's just, I think what's really happened, yeah, in this moment is that there's just no way of talking about things being just a little bit bad. So right. it has to be, it can't be that a 26 year old is different. I would even say from a 36 year old, although I've just, we, we've discussed that Jeff Goldblum's wife is 36 and is apparently a child. So I'm happy that I'm, you know, so youthful, but, <laughs> but yeah. Um, but I think it could be that like, there's something to it, but it's not, um, but that it's impossible to talk about a situation where you were a bit screwed over, but not the true victim in some right. sort of timeless and unquestionable sense. Right. It's yeah. almost become impossible to talk about a bad thing that happened without it having been, you know, a, a situation where there was a bad guy and a good guy, um, you know, to have, you know, to have experienced something that hurt you without having necessarily been wronged. Yeah. Yeah. It's like this, this discomfort with complexity. Like I, I really think that a lot of the problem is that, 
people refuse to sort of sit with their own sense of conflictedness. So it's like, you know, you can be, we, we all contain multitudes, right? Like, you know, you can be a good person who does a bad thing. And I get, I think this also just feeds into this kind of um, lack of redemption that you see in the quote unquote religion of sort of the extreme corners of social justice, because that's often compared to sort of fundamentalist Christianity, but the big difference there is there's no redemption. <laughs> like the, you know, with the extreme social justice activists don't make any room for, for, for redemption or, or, you know, sort of getting better. And so I, that it's interesting. So if, if there's an idea that like, if you're 26, you can't just say, well, I was an adult and I made a couple of mistakes. You actually have to go straight to, well, I was a child and I'm not accountable for any of this. And I, it I seems all part of the same piece. Yeah. Um, something you hit on, we're sort of jumping around in our outline, but I think that's okay. Sorry, I'm, 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 I'm ta- asking you too many questions is what I'm doing. No, no, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and something that you hit on before that I um, was really interested in this essay in your book, you were talking about um, your childhood as a, as a tomboy, which is something um, that I think, and I think Phoebe and I are sort of like in the last cohort who was part of the like the the cohort of babies where it wasn't possible to know the gender and it or the sex in advance, and I didn't realize that that was only a thing. No, I think it, I think it was possible. It's well, it says in the I don't know. It said in the book that it was only it only became possible like in the eighties, mid to late eighties. I think you started to see it. I mean, I think people were doing it in very sort of specialized ways. I don't think it became sort of de rigueur until. Hmm. The early, early nineties, early mid nineties. Yeah, I don't know if it was so common. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think my parents knew beforehand. I don't think I was. Mine knew either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, so, you know, when you, once, once it became possible to know in advance whether it was going to be a boy or a girl, um, you know, childhood became much more gendered. And I just sort of, I don't know. I sort of wonder if there's like, um, this idea of femininity and fragility going hand in hand that is making women who came of age in this sort of more neutral, gender neutral point, wanting to sort of retrofit their own past experiences to something more in line with what younger millennials have experienced growing up. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really interesting when you look back even on images of children playing or just like toy, toy advertisements in the seventies, the toys are like earth tones. Like you do not see so many pink toys versus blue toys. Obviously that did exist to some extent, but there's actually data on this. The the majority of, of toys that children played with were, were gender neutral. Like we all played with blocks and, you know, Legos and we all watched the bad news bears. And there wasn't this sense of like girlhood versus boyhood as much as we were just kids. And there were, you know, there was like this show Zoom that I talk about a lot, which came out of um, WGBH in Boston, where the, the kids, you know, they would sing songs. It was a, it was a public television show. And it was just very sort of androgynous. There was a real aesthetic of androgyny around, around being a kid at that time. So yeah, then I started noticing, you know, why is it that like by the time we got to the nineties, that that's the Disney princess obsession. And like, you definitely, you can go into Target and there's like, the boy toys and the girl toys and they're really gen- color coded. Mm-hmm. And I, I started to like gin up this theory that as soon as parents became able to know the sex of the baby in utero, maybe they sort of subconsciously in, just started baking up a lot of stereotypes. Like you, know, you would, mm-hmm. if you bring a baby home to a nursery that is decked out in pink taffeta is that I'm looking around, I'm looking around at our back? bedroom here that is both nursery and bedroom for all of us, including a poodle. Um, but this, this just, I mean, to add a sort of anecdotal level to this, it, it's so expected now that you know if you're having a boy or a girl that, that it is genuinely difficult when you are looking for, I, I speak from recent experience, when you are looking for clothing for a not yet born baby to find non pink or blue. And I mean, I yeah. don't care. And now, and if you don't care, and if you don't do a, the bow on a baby, you have a boy. So while I have a daughter who's almost a year old, um, 
effectively to many strangers every day, it's like a sun because wow. she's wearing a bow. Even a if you're bow. wearing something that's pink, but because like most babies, she does not have, you know, cascading hair <laughs> to hair, you know, um, yeah, yeah, that's how it is. So it's like genuinely like there, it's not as opt out. Like, I guess I had kind of always imagined it as that people are sort of trying to find the blue thing or the pink thing, but it's like, you have to look if you don't want that. And then that becomes its own statement, you know? And it's like, um, I mean, the yeah. fact that there is such a thing as gender reveal parties, I mean, that is like, truly astonishing and it's so telling that that phenomenon is running right alongside this other thing of non-binary like we're obsessed with gender well, they're clearly they're clearly linked in some way right yes. where where the feeling that i mean i guess i don't know if this is problematic or just what everybody thinks or i don't know but just this notion that if to be a woman means loving the pink and the frilly and all of this then who are you if you're a woman and you don't love the pink and the frilly and all of this, or you don't every day love the pink and the frilly, whatever. And then you're left with like, well, how could you be a woman if that's what it means to be a woman? How could you be a girl if that's what it means to be a girl and all of that? So, and maybe you're trans, right? right. Or not binary or whatever. And it's, yeah. And I think it seems like the more rigid the gender roles and the kind of mainstream, mainstream culture, the harder it is to conceptualize a, gender identity that isn't just this sort of cartoon thing. Totally. Yeah. And that is something that as a, as a Gen Xer, I just feel really lucky to have grown up when there was just a wider range of expression as a girl and then, and more so for girls than even boys. So I think, yeah, I talked about this later, but I felt like it was better to be a girl than a boy. It was luckier. You just had more freedom. There was more sort of an imaginative uh, there were just more imaginative possibilities about your life and your and your physical presentation, and the fact that that's being cut off at the you know that's being truncated. I think that might be contributing to this sort of malaise of of the female condition that that you're hearing all, all the time. Um, so what I was saying is that uh, the this sort of gender free childhood um, and you know the sense of it being better to be a girl was such a sort of a wide open thing. It was about um, just like the sort of expansive possibilities. And it was happening, it occurs to me, in the absence of this sort of targeted girl power marketing. Um, you know, I suppose there was such a thing as T-shirts with the future is female written on them. But I don't think it was so ubiquitous. Um, Mine you know, definitely says that. You just can't see it's cut off. It, says, <laughs> it has all the slogans just, just below the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel. I assume that you're just sitting on a giant pile of Disney princess dresses. Maybe you're even wearing one from the waist down. Who knows? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, but yeah, that you know, uh, as as the idea of feminism has become not just mainstream but commercialized, um, that what it means to be a woman or an empowered woman has taken on this really different cast. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, there's the, the corporate version of the, I call it the badass feminism, right? Like it's this, this, the, the, the idea of the badass sort of emerged, I don't know, it was like around maybe 2012 even or something. And it started off as being this kind of cool, like it, it didn't have the sort of corporate connotations. It was just a way of talking about yourself in a sort of sassy manner. Uh, and then you got the kind of, you know, the, the, the corporate, uh, branded version of feminism. You had Beyonce stepping out in front of the lit up feminist sign at the VMAs. And, um, I don't know. I, I just, and again, I, I'm conflicted because I am somebody who grew up right alongside second wave feminism. Like literally, like I was born in 1970. Uh, you know, I was seven, I was three years old when, when Roe v. Wade was passed. I mean, you know, my mother was a second wave feminist. I always thought of feminism as, a sort of like earthy, um, you know, very kind of like almost, almost like uncool, like so, so uncool. It was cool kind of way of being in the world, our bodies, ourselves, like there was a sort of gritty aesthetic to it. And so I was perplexed when, when I was seeing this sort of shiny branded version of it. Um, and then from there troubled by, uh, the way that the conversation was going toward this thing where the default, the default premise was that 
women were under the thumb of this terrible patriarchy. And, and the conversation became so much about uh, how we were suffering at the, at the hands of men. And that was happening at the very time that, that women were doing better than ever in so many ways. Um, and so that was a, a paradox that, that I really wanted to explore. And again, like, check my blind spots. I'm not going to say check my privilege, but, you know, check, check my premise in a way. Well, what I think is so interesting is about, about our moment with this. And this is something, there's a line that I think about constantly from, I guess, Bridget, and I'm going to screw up her last name, Fetazi? Fetazi. Oh, Bridget Fetazi. Thank you, because I know you've done blogging heads with her. Yeah. I um, haven't actually. I've never, I've never had. I did. I had, she was a guest while Phoebe was on maternity leave. Yes. Yes. Oh, you yeah. did. Yes. Okay. Um, there's just, she has some article on tablet where she wrote something about like how as a woman, she's supposed to be like the most oppressed person, but as a white woman, she's supposed to be the most oppressive person. And there is just something that I just like keep returning to about this sort of moment where there's like this notion of woman as ultimate victim somehow runs parallel to, is it that it runs parallel to this notion of woman as if privileged? And that could be some huge category, like a cis het woman is privileged and that's like nearly all women. Um, like, it, is it just that somebody further to the left will think that all women are like the most you know, like, or nearly all but a few women are the most privileged people and actually the real oppressors or like, I'm just trying to make like, I just spend a lot of time trying to make sense of this because it's these two things that seem to say the opposite. Whereas I think the reality is just like, it's kind of the common sense thing where like sexism is real, but also women are not always in a tragic situation. It's not actually that I think what's fascinating is the intersection of that too, where if a woman positions herself as a victim at an inopportune time, she's like doing white women's tears and she's actually, her victimhood is oppressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Intersection is exactly the word there. And we forget that intersectionality refers not only to overlapping layers of oppression, but overlapping layers of privilege. So, you know, power, you know, the, 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 you know, the um, sort of intersectional feminists and the sort of mainstream you know, social justice left sort of, you know, opinion space. It's always about power. There's so much talk about, you know, hierarchies of power, but like power shifts all the time. It's fluid. Like it, it's, it's constantly sort of volleying between people. And I feel like a lot of the conversation around male and female power, it, it's so focused on this tiny, tiny percentage of, of, of men who are in the corridors of power. Like, yes, me, white men are in charge uh, in, in, in politics, in, you know, C-suites of Fortune 500 companies at the highest, you know, the highest institutional levels. But that is like a tiny, tiny sliver of the population. In the aggregate, men are doing far worse than, than women. And, and the power that they're, that they're trying to assert really often just it seems to me like the last gasps of this sort of, you know, patriarchy as it was formally defined. And, and I feel like that conversation is just, it's, it's missing because it's, it's, it's like discouraged. There's no incentive to have this kind of conversation because like immediately it'll, someone will just say, well, what do you mean? Like white, white men are in charge and we have a pussy grabber in chief and blah, blah, blah. And it's like so much more complicated than that. The, the most men are, are not um, like putting on a suit every day and going to work and, and mansplaining at their female colleagues. It's, they're just not. Well, there's also this form of power that hardly ever gets talked about in these conversations, which is the unique power of being a younger, conventionally attractive women, woman. And um, there's something, Phoebe, you had a note about this um, in terms of how it relates to me, too. That I Yes, think, uh, yes. Um, so something that I've been thinking about a lot is just this question of the sort of the narrative that Me Too... Um, the stories of Me Too versus the stories of women generally and the way um, Me Too kind of, I mean, just from the very expression, assumes a certain universality, right? Like this is a woman's story is like so when it's really just um, 
it's not that these are non-problems, but these are very specific problems of being young, of being attractive, of being in a kind of elite or at least interesting workplace or on a date with somebody kind of prominent or interesting to be written about, um, stories that happen to be titillating so the the news will cover it. Um, and just there's something about the way um, Me Too and just feminism of this moment generally um, like really um, focuses on the sort of it, like the only true feminist complaints are the feminist complaints of a young and beautiful woman. And that ignores a whole lot of things that have nothing to do with romance. Right. But it also ignores, you know, like anything that basically isn't that, which is a lot. I mean, I think there have, you know, there certainly have been major investigations and reporting on women in, in factories, working class women, poor women who have Me Too stories that are really legitimate and don't have anything to do with being like a young, hot, ambitious intern who's being manipulated by, by a boss. Like, like I do think there are, there are a lot of versions of this, but yeah, you're absolutely right. The ones that we hear about are the ones that involve celebrities and, the sorts of people that journalists writing for prestigious publications would know and, and, and those sorts of stories. But, you know, I'm, I'm so like, um, I have to say, I don't mean to go off on a tangent here, but uh, I recently saw the, this new documentary about Jordan Peterson and uh, we don't have to go into great detail about it. The rise of Jordan Peterson. Although I will say it's, it's, it's impartial and it's really excellent. They do a really, really good job. Um, but you know, there's a moment in it where he's talking about like women wearing high heels to the office and women wearing makeup in the office and, and what, what is, why are they doing it and what is the purpose of it? And if, if they're on some level, women have evolved to, to please men. So they're, so they're wearing high heels to the office and on some level, maybe they're like, it's, it's understand, not that it's excusable, but it's understandable that there would be workplace harassment. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, okay, yeah, like women are, are dressing up to be, you know, you want to look attractive, maybe even sexy in an office. But that is because if you're ambitious, there is some sort of mandate to look hot. So you can, you can be the sort of person that male superiors want to be around. Like this, it okay. is so complicated and it's, it's true. Like everything is sort of true at once. Well, I think with something like that, I do think it is like, I, I see that more as, and I'm going to be the social justice warrior here, but I guess I do see that as like that the problem is the workplace and it's not really a form. It's, it's not really a form of power to try to look hot at the office because if you don't have the op- option not to, whereas does it benefit men to look hot in the workplace in the same way? I mean, it benefits them to look sharp like look polished look professional but it's not a sex they don't they don't need to like wear uncomfortable shoes you know right yeah right Right. i don't know i'm just thinking out loud here i don't i just i think that like it's there's a it's a swirl yeah i mean but it's also i suppose you know the conundrum too for the woman you know for whom looking hot is just simply not a possibility right yeah, and that's the other part of this we never, we never ever admit is that when we are, you know, there are, it's, a, it's not, it's probably not even half of all women who really have, have the option to. Well, right. Oh my goodness. So, problem. so people do talk about this a little bit. I have a blog post on it and this writer, Marie LeCompte, who is fantastic, a British writer, has a blog post on it that I link to in mine and a couple, like there's like two people talking about it, definitely, <laughs> that it is really this question of, if you are hot, how does it go for you? And I think it's a much bigger question that, that this is actually all under the banner, could be under the banner of Me Too, of if the workplace only takes women seriously if they're hot, this is bad also for women, not just for women who aren't hot, but for women who in a particular context aren't perceived of as hot. And I think what was, I believe in this post that I'm, this Marie Lacan's post, but also just, something I found is I have been the hot one. I have been the not hot one, depending on which workplace or whatever life context I have been in both roles. And I bet that's more common than only ever being in one. Right. Women, you know, um, certainly women who aren't like 22, but also just in general, like I think um, like what I 
talked about, I'm going to, this is so, I'm so cool that I'm going to cite my own blog post here. There's <laughs> not on my personal blog. It was the coolest thing a person could do. But <laughs> there was this time in grad school um, when I was on some sort of committee to do something like for the department where these professors in my department, the committee was two professors who were both men, possibly both gay. I don't remember, but anyway, and, um, a fellow, um, woman grad student, um, in the program. And they, these professors were saying that, um, what we should do to promote the department is put on our flyers, a picture of this third, uh, female grad student who is incredibly beautiful. And she is like, she's stunningly beautiful. Um, and we were just kind of sitting there like, okay, <laughs> like, I mean, in a way this wasn't wrong, but then it's like, was that a, is that, and, and she's pleasant looking, nice looking, you know, this other woman. And I, you know, did not have trouble finding dates in my early twenties or you know what I mean? But right. should we, was that a me too story? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, but it, like it was, and it wasn't like it was, I don't even mean, obviously it wasn't a big deal. That's like, why, why not? not me too? <laughs> no, but <laughs> <laughs> what am I? Right. No, but I mean, I think there is something though, where the fact of women being judged in that way in the workplace, I mean, what if, what if a woman's not hired to begin with because she's not found hot, you know, like, isn't that like to, I mean, the, my anecdotes a bit silly, but I'm saying like in this could be like actually a thing you well know? I mean it is a thing but it's not just a woman thing right. I mean, it's it's been like studied and I think proven that people who are generically or generically conventionally <laughs> attractive have um you know an easier time of it all throughout life it's easier to get a job it's easier to find romantic partners it's easier to find friends you know the mm-hmm. world is friendlier to well, you absolutely and then, and yeah we're short uh have a real problem I mean men and height that I think that correlates fairly closely to women and attractiveness. Well, I think so. But I I think, um, with the, with the, um, what's keep striking me and what I was trying to convey in the note to myself, but didn't quite articulate there as well as I would have wanted. But, um, I think the issue with the way me too frames things is the ultimate victim is the young and beautiful woman. Mm. If that makes sense of among women, like if you are not bothered all the time by men, that is unambiguous privilege. And I think it's a bit more complicated and being bothered all the time by men is bad. Not being paid any attention to by men can also have sort of practical consequences regardless of your personal feelings about this. Yeah. And there's also, I mean, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I'm, you've probably noticed there's a little subtle little game women play where you can complain about getting catcalled or your me too situation or whatever, but there's a level in which it functions as a brag. I mean, I've, I've had actually students uh, write about this, this, especially very, very young women. I've, I've like, they've talked about how it's like they, they get catcalled on the street and then they sort of go back to their friends. And then there's this competitive complaining about who was harassed on the street more. And it's functioning on a couple levels. One of which is, is social currency and, and hotness. Like you're, you know, you, it's a way of showing off. Well, you're not going to get in trouble with me for saying this because I think, um, well, I don't know if it's necessarily exactly that it's showing off, but more that there's, I think a stigma in not sharing these stories because it's mm-hmm. like admitting that you're not somebody all the men are noticing. Oh, okay. right. Yeah. If it's been too long since you shared one, you've got to put on a mini skirt and go out for a stroll in the hopes that somebody will, you know, give you a story to tell, you know, got to maintain think, your relevance. I think it's weird because I think there is feeling genuinely scared of these situations, being annoyed by, you know, yeah. but I think, I think it's impossible in a society where your value, even in the workplace is based on hotness. It's like rational to, want that you know like it's not um well if it's a way of getting ahead of course you want it it's it's a it's power and again this goes like the power is shifting all the time it's like always always in flux yeah well this kind of brings us really naturally to something that i wanted to talk about um and it ties into your 
Me Too related essay in the book where you talk about your experience of being a young woman in New York versus um, a not so young woman in New York. <laughs> and <laughs> that was not meant as like, an <laughs> my apartment's um, a lot nicer now that I'm not, not I was going to say it looks really like gorgeous. Um, <laughs> but the, um, you know, speaking of where power ends up centering in these feminist conversations, an awful lot of the criticisms of your book, um, to my great frustration, have been centered mainly on attacking your age rather than your ideas. Um, <laughs> particularly thinking of this BuzzFeed review. Oh boy. The one that, that specifically, I think it was even in the headline, it was like Megan Dom wants you to get off her lawn. And oh, was, that was a New Yorker. That was a little rude. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> that and why phenomenon. are you not, why are you not personally Gia Tolentino? Why are why are you a different person? I tried. Place? Can you get? Can you be like it? Like a? Can I get Gia Tolentino affirmation surgery? I, I, I would like that. If that uh, were possible, we would both have gotten a big it. waiting oh, list. For <laughs> years in advance. Um, uh, you know, I actually have not been reading the reviews, uh, so I, I sort of know what's in them, uh, and I see the headlines sometimes, but um, I have to, in order to sort of stay on my game and, and stay sane, I'm, I'm really, like, staying off of them, uh, and I don't see the Twitter mentions unless, like, somebody actually ats me, so I can only imagine what what's going on there. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things in play. I mean, one of them is that I was a very, I, I had success as a writer at a very young age. So I, you know, I had a couple big pieces in the New Yorker when I was in my mid twenties. Um, and I was, you know, it was like, oh, she's the voice of her generation. Like that was kind of the, the shtick around me. So I think in a lot of ways, and, and I also benefited from, from elite media. I mean, I was very much in the embrace of the New Yorker and Harper's and the New York times and every book I've had up until now, I've had like major national public radio interviews. So I think I'm a very easy target because I'm an absolutely privileged, not only am I a privileged white feminist, I'm, I'm privileged to have like come up and as a writer when legacy media was, you know, had more currency than it does now. And, and the gatekeeping was, it was much more intense, but once you, once you made it past the gates, you could really sort of, you know, I could support myself as a writer, not really well, but, but certainly in ways that are, are much more difficult now. So, um, I think I'm a pretty, I'm a, I'm a pretty easy punching bag, um, in that sense. And I, I also wrote a lot about being a young person. Um, and I wrote a lot about myself and it's funny because I, I teach personal essay and memoir now. And one of the things I just emphasize again and again and again is that you cannot just write about your experience. You have to universalize it. Like you have to do reporting. You have to bring other things in. And that's one of the things that you don't see as much in, in personal writing today. I think like the personal essay has been given a bad name just by the sort of, you know, the, the business model of, of digital media. There's just less editing and, they kind of let everything through. Anyway, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here, but I think that the ageism, it's, it's a lot of it is, is, has to do with the sort of particularities of my career. And, um, uh, and, and it's, I, I, it's funny that the okay boomer thing like has arisen in the last few weeks, but I feel like it's, it's sort of like, it's on this, it's the, criticizing my age has kind of, uh, coalesced with this sort of more ambient, uh, uh, you know, criticism of old people generally. And I don't, I don't know how, how connected they are, you know, sort of mm. organically. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. But I didn't answer, I can't remember what your actual question was. What do I think of the reviews? I haven't been reading it. That's why my answer is so incoherent. Yeah, no, it's, it was more about, you know, what is, what is happening that is, that is leading this to be the line of criticism that people are taking rather than, I mean, you know, the, I, I keep coming back to this BuzzFeed review, which was so frustrating to read as somebody who, who had already read your book, um, you know, seeing what was being said, it was like, it was like they had not read the same. I don't think to be, they yeah. I mean, they seem to be missing that the point. Well, they're was making the point that you were. They, no, but they seem to be. Well, yeah, they're making the point, but it seemed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just seemed like the whole, like the accusation that you are out of touch with 
the young people today seem to be kind of like, that's your point in certain parts of the book. You know what I mean? Not that you're out of touch, but you know what I mean? That you, you don't, you know what I mean? But like to say, to give it as an accusation when that's kind of the point is these generational differences. That's like, that's the thing that really struck me with the Buzzfeed piece. Cause I was just looking at it again and it's like, yeah, I don't know this like, but, you know, like, but, but Gio Tolentino is more with it. It's like, well, yeah, yeah, I think that, like that's kind of the whole, but, but that's because she is the, the sort of like the, the, the feminism of this moment in a way. And, and she's a, she's a very talented writer. I mean, she's both are very, I, writer, I'm big fans right? of you both. I'm big I mean, I would, I would much rather have her be the anointed, um, you know, woman writer of the, of the day than, many other people I can think of. So I, I, my hat's off to her. I, I mean, I think that part of the problem here is too, like the book, it's sort of neither fish nor fowl. And, you know, it's not, it's, it's not, uh, you know, just sort of a blunt instrument indictment of, of millennials. It's not get off my lawn. I mean, that was the, <laughs> the headline of the New Yorker review. Um, but neither is it uh, like, oh, I'm, I'm so apologetic. I'm so out of touch. Like millennials are right. Like, like I said, like it's an interrogation and it's really, you know, more than, more than being about, about politics or gender, really anything. It's a book about conversation and it's about thinking and it's about nuance and that in and of itself it is defies category. So I think it's actually really, really hard to, to write about, um, sort of content that that occupies this space, like they're just something in and of itself. There, there's not a lot of um, the, the, there's people sort of can't walk and chew gum at the same time in the in the media space, and it's very hard to sort of cover this kind of book. Um, well, I liked how you approached it, and I mean, this is something that yeah, I've thought about a lot as well. Just like how do you write about? how do you do like intra left type criticism at a time like this is always, right. expressed, you know, but also just um, what to do in terms of situating yourself in the story. And I just, um, you know, rather than it just being a sort of a litany of identity categories or sort of saying like, well, how do you actually like meaningfully relate yeah. to all of it? And I thought that you did that really well. I, I really like that. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I also, you know, one of the criticisms of the book and it's understandable is that I use my myself as a test case too much. Like it's, you know, you're, you're seeing it through, you know, it's, it's idiocentric. You're just looking at it through your own lens. I mean, I certainly uh, tried at times to get away from that and write a more, a more general book, a more reported book. But I mean, I just think my own temperament and just the, the challenges of trying to write about a cultural moment that is still going on. It's, it's so difficult to do that I really didn't see any way to um, do right by the material other than to put it, you know, to, to sort of structure it as a kind of intellectual memoir. So, I mean, I, you know, I think there, yeah, I think there are ways, yeah. you know, you can't, you cannot, by definition, you, you can't, you know, no, no piece of, piece of, you know, creative expression is perfect and you can't please everyone, but um I, I think it would have been, uh, I, I, it, I'm still glad that I structured it this way, even though, you know, it's not for every, it's not pleasing everybody. Well, we were pleased. <laughs> Thank yes. you. You're my so ideal good. audience. So. <laughs> well, um, Kat, Friendly you... millennial feminists. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, one of the things in the BuzzFeed review that, that really <laughs> that infuriated me, I would keep coming back to this, was that it said something like, you know, like Dom is at her best when she, you know, when she writes personal essays about her own life and she didn't do that here. And I was like, yes, she did. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, because I think that, you know, what's, what's interesting about this is that it is ultimately like your lens and it is very personal. Um, but also very relatable, you know, as somebody who's not yet, you know, past certain milestones, but is sort of coming up just behind you and kind of sort of see the lay of the land. Um, and as a dialogue with the generations that are behind us, you know, the sort of younger millennial feminists, I think it works very well if people are open to it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's also been really interesting about this in a way it's the least controversial book I've ever written. It's being framed as, Oh my God, uh, she's betrayed us all. She's, she's gone rogue. Um, but I was, I was writing pretty, um, 
not, not contrarian and not gratuitously provocative, but I was, I was writing controversial pieces very early in my career. And that is actually how I was able to carve out a career for myself. I, I, you know, the pieces in my first book, my misspent youth, which everyone lionizes now, but by the way, got some pretty ne- negative reviews back in the day. And, and I dare say would not even be published today because it is nothing if not like a privileged white young person living in New York City talking about how difficult it is to um, have her apartment the way she wants it um, based on her, her like, you know, worship of Woody Allen movies growing up in the 80s. I mean, there is like nothing, every single thing about my misspent youth is problematic. Yep. And it's, I find it like amazing yeah. that people are comparing this book unfavorably to it and saying like the problem is she's not still doing that book. I think it's about the different background. Like it's the different cultural background is in like anything now that's challenging anything kind of is like things are either good or bad right. like in terms of like morally good or bad. They're, you know, either problematic or not. And there isn't the same leeway for things to just kind of be maybe mm-hmm. so maybe that's yeah. it maybe it's like if, if it's either a book is problematic or it isn't and yeah I don't know maybe yours yeah. is too problematic for that <laughs> but you know what can you do but you know it's funny like I've had when I do events I mean I have people come up to me at at readings and at book signings and are like oh my gosh thank you like this is what I needed to hear like I, it's there is a, a gulf between the on the ground response and the media response that I have not seen until now in my publishing mm. career and in, oh, that's, in that's books, interesting. I've never seen um such a such a wide gap that's interesting. I wonder if that is partially about the chasm between the kind of interactions that we have offline versus the ones that we have over the internet. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, again, like part of the reason that I, I really felt I needed to do this book was that I, I just, if, if we're going to live in a society where the most important conversations are happening in the back channels, that's really troubling. It's really dangerous. Um, and so to the extent that I'm going to try to take some of those back channel conversations and bring them onto the page, that is what I've always done in my career. There, that has been my interest and my, my approach since the early 90s. And it's just really stunning to see um, how an approach that was once rewarded, it was the entire point of being a journalist and being a public thinker, it was what you were supposed to do. That is now considered exactly what you're not supposed to do. And you will not be rewarded for it. You could potentially be, be penalized for it. It's, it's a, like a complete reversal of the, of the intellectual value system. Mm-hmm. Well, um, <laughs> I, I know from my notes that I could keep asking you questions for the next like 10 yeah, hours, but I know I, I love this. Not do that. But, um, Kat, do you have... You know, I think that we've we've come so beautifully full circle that we should probably cap it here. And, um, you know, so once again, the book that Megan Dom wrote is The Problem with Everything. Um, You should, I don't know, buy it. (laughs) Buy it. It's true. Read it. Debate it. You know. Talk about what is the problem with the problem. Yeah. Exactly. And Megan, thanks so much for joining yes. us. This has been Thank fantastic. You. Thank you so much for coming on our program. Really fun. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.